We're back. We're back. All right. We're back. We're back. You're a okay. witness. Okay. So you can say oath or whatever, but are you calling yourself as a witness? Or do you want Mr. Spyro to call you as a witness? It doesn't matter to me. How do you want to do it? I, I don't think it's necessary, frankly, for this evidentiary record for me to call Ms. Morrissey. I know what happened, and the court knows what happened. Uh, <laughs> okay, do you want to call yourself oh, as a sure. witness? Yeah. No, well, just, just a minute. So he's willing, as I understand it, to rest now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, you don't have to say anything under oath if you don't want it. No, I'm happy to. You have a fifth amendment right, Gary. I'm happy to. Uh, uh, you know, I I'm trying to help you, Gary. It doesn't matter to me what you call You have the right to remain silent. It doesn't Make matter that it will be used against you. So, if you're calling yourself as a witness, there's no one here that's requiring you to be called as a witness. The information, everything that happened in this regard, especially as it pertains to me, needs to come out in the public. All right. So, you're calling yourself oh, as a witness. Oh, this is an ego and thing now. Uh, oh, no. It is my understanding that the court indicated to me previously that you wanted me to testify. I understand you've now changed your mind. I think it's a good idea if I do it. Where would you like me? No. Ego thing, Carrie. No, no. I'm okay, sure. <laughs> Let me go with oh, that. This is a bit of a funny. Well, let's kind of this, is, this is this, this is pretty is much toe sucker. I'm super important right her, now. Ms. Morrissey Live. voluntarily calling herself as a witness without any requirement by the court to do so. Let me Remember, you have the right to remain silent. Please raise your right hand. I'd rather not know what I'm talking. You swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Spenny 2.0. Go ahead. Where's that pink dress back? During my investigation of this case and my review of the evidence in this case, I came to understand that there was a large batch of live ammunition that was in the possession of Thel Reed, Hannah Gutierrez's father. That father. I also understood from all of the evidence and testimony that a portion of that batch of ammunition that belonged to Thel Reed was taken by Thel Reed and Seth Kinney to the 1883 cowboy training camp when that was over, leftover ammunition was taken back to PDQ props. Mm -hmm. yep. Seth Kenny took some of the ammunition from that container that he came back from Texas and turned it into the sheriff's department. And it appeared to me that he did it to try to exonerate himself. They took it. Okay. From Mr. Kenny, and they tagged it into evidence under the Rust case. Law enforcement then executed a search warrant at PDQ Props, and they took the entire container. Um, and I, I will say that I do agree, as I recall, although I don't have it in front of me, I do agree that uh, the search warrant didn't really require law enforcement to take everything, but it was my understanding that Mr. Kenny gave them everything so that they would have it and could tag it into evidence. Portions of that ammunition were then sent to the FBI for testing so that they could be compared to the live rounds that were found on the set of rust. The FBI testing demonstrated that the live rounds that were taken from PDQ props that were originally in Texas did not match the live rounds on the set of rust. And that's testimony that we heard during the Gutierrez trial. So, what ended up happening was Mr. Bowles, Ms. Gutierrez's lawyer, put Mr. Teske on a witness list and was intending to call him as a witness to the Gutierrez trial. I conducted a pretrial interview of Mr. Teske, and I, I want to back up. I did at this point have some understanding 
that Mr. Teske had had contact with law enforcement regarding these rounds that he still had in Arizona. So these are rounds that never left Arizona. They were always in the possession of Thel Reed and Troy Teske. How sure are you of that? They never went to Texas. They never came to New Mexico. That's what all of the evidence indicated. So I understood that Detective Hancock had communication with Mr. Teske about trying to get those rounds and Detective Hancock was unable to get those rounds from Mr. Teske. I did not find that particularly concerning because those rounds had never left Arizona. The filming of Rust was in the state of New Mexico. And the rounds that were taken from, from PDQ went from Arizona to Texas to Albuquerque. So ammunition that is in the state of Arizona that has never left Arizona did not strike me that it had significant evidentiary value. Then, oh, oh and I will, tell, I will say, I believe I actually saw a photo of it at that point in time. I was able to look at the ammunition myself and it was visibly dissimilar than the rounds from the set of rust. Really? We mm. then cut to November of 2023. Mr. Bowles has put Mr. Teske on a witness list for the Hannah Gutierrez case. We conducted a pretrial interview with Mr. Teske on November 2nd of 2023. At that point in time, he brought up that he was still in possession of these live rounds that were Thel Reed's live rounds that had never left the state of Arizona. I then, when he started, I think he, I think he indicated during the pretrial interview that they were from the same batch that was sourced from Joe Swanson. And I then said, we should get those from you. I had a conversation with Detective Hancock after that pretrial interview about how we could get the rounds from Mr. Teske. And we were trying to figure out if we could send a local law enforcement agency to pick them up. I was then decided that I needed to figure out if that was necessary since they had never left Arizona. And up to that point, it was my impression that they did not match the live rounds from the set of rust. I then, as I recall, reached out to Mr. Bowles. He and I had a conversation about whether or not the rounds should be tested by the FBI. And I was still trying to figure out if I could get the rounds from Arizona to New Mexico. So I asked Mr. Bowles to please send me a photograph of the rounds from Troy Teske so that I could see with my eyes whether they were even remotely similar. Being an if asshole. they were similar, I could go through the steps of obtaining the ammunition, connecting probably with local law enforcement, having a local law enforcement agency go uh, to Mr. Teske's residence and collect them. I didn't want to do that uh, if they didn't look anything like the rounds from the set of rust because all five, all six rounds from the set of rust are identical to each other. So when I had this conversation with Mr. Bowles, he provided me the photograph that I showed this morning and this is a, it was my understanding that this was a photograph from Troy Teske. Okay. So Bowles so knew about this. Troy and I don't uh, communicate. He's a defense witness. I can't communicate with a defense witness. Um, so Mr. Bowles, as I recall, texted me this photo. And this is a photo that Mr. Teske took at my request so that I could determine whether this ammunition was related in any way to the set of rust 
because it never left the state of Arizona. So if it never left the state of Arizona, the only way that it is relevant to the Rust investigation is if it has any similarity to the live rounds that were found on the set of Rust, because we were at that point trying to figure out the source of the live rounds. When I received this photograph from Mr. Bowles, I could immediately tell that these are very dissimilar from the live rounds that were found on the set of Rust. They have brass primers. So, so this is what was <clears throat> presented to the prosecution <clears throat> as the rounds that were in Mr. Teske's possession. They have brass primers and not silver primers. Um, yes, he will get one the One of them, the one on the left, appears to be a Starline brass casing. Yes, he will. But they have truncated cone projectiles. We had seen ammunition that looked exactly like this. Not exactly, but, but very, very similar. And that ammunition was the ammunition that was collected from the Sheriff's Department and went to the FBI for testing and was determined not Yes. to be similar in any way to the live rounds on the set of rust. Injection rounds. So when I saw this photograph, I could see that it was not at all similar to the live rounds on the set of rust. And I decided not to take any steps to collect this ammunition because it was in Arizona had never come to New Mexico and didn't match the live rounds on the set of rust. So what ends up happening is Mr. Teske is called to New Mexico by Mr. Bowles to testify at the Gutierrez trial. And you can hear on the video that the court yes, and then he brought it on Mr. Teske say the defense attorney, that's fire. not me, asked him to bring samples of that ammunition. According to Mr. Teske, he brought the samples of the ammunition, showed them to the defense attorney, and the defense attorney said, I don't want those. I'm not going to use those. And by the way, I'm not going to call you as a witness. So Mr. Teske sat in court during the trial. And then at some point contacted the deputies downstairs and said, I have this ammunition. So he tried to give it to the defense attorney. Who's the person who asked him to bring it. The defense attorney said no. And he oh, then Jason, Jason tried oh. to get a hold of detective Hancock, who was not available because she was with me. So then he ends up going to the sheriff's department and he leaves the ammunition at the sheriff's department. Time to hear from Troy at this point. I was contacted. I don't think it was the same day, but I'm not a hundred percent sure it's possible that it was by detective Hancock. And she indicated that Troy Teske had dropped off ammunition at the sheriff's department because I had already asked for a photograph of it. I believed that that ammunition was going to look like the photograph that Mr. Bowles had sent me. Corporal Hancock indicated that she was going to tag them into evidence and she was going to create what she called a doc report. And I said, great, do that. I was not aware at that point in time that a doc report would not have the same case number as Rust. I was not aware at that point in time that it would not be linked to the Rust case number. When did you know? I understood that he had dropped off ammunition that I believed to not look similar to 
the ammunition from the set of rust. And I had no idea that it wasn't going to have the same case number. I want to show the court, though, when Mr. Teske showed up to testify with the, live, with the ammunition that Mr. Bowles told him to bring to the state of New Mexico, he was not called as a witness, and Mr. Bowles said, I'm not taking that ammunition from you. Jason Bowles is an idiot, though. That doesn't mean anything. That's why. Because these are photographs from Hannah Gutierrez's cell phone extraction, and they show spot-on match for the live rounds found on the set of Rust. Yeah, her this is room. clearly the reason that Mr. Bowles said, you and your ammunition better get out of here because it would not have hurt the case, the state's case against Hannah Gutierrez. It would have been the best evidence I could have hoped for. These are. I don't know if I go that far, but yes, these it would have been helpful. Look exactly like the ammunition, the actual ammunition that we have in evidence. And they do look like the three rounds that are in that envelope. So when Mr. Teske couldn't get Mr. Bowles to take them because they were the best evidence against his client. He took them over to the sheriff's department. And when he dropped them at the sheriff's department, I was told that there was going to be a report. There was a report. I assumed they looked like these. And Detective Hancock indicated to me that because he dropped them off and he didn't wait for her, she was then going to try to follow up with him, take a statement from him so that we could get some idea where they came from, what the relevance was, if there was any relevance at all. And he never returned her phone calls. And that's all of the information that I can give the court, but I'm happy to answer any questions. He's like, I got questions, bitch. Here comes Spiro. May I ask a few questions, Ron? When you took over this case, um, the investigator handling the case, Mr. Schilling left the case, correct? At my request, yes. The paralegal that was handling this case with you left the case, Mr. Tatt. At my request, yes. Well, the first prosecutor that was working with you on this case, you selected, correct? I did. And he resigned too? I wouldn't say that he resigned, no. Okay. He didn't stay on the case for the Alec Baldwin trial, correct? No, and he indicated that that was because he represented a labor union that's a national labor union, and he was not expecting the trial to be set so quickly. He wasn't expecting it to be set in July. So when he realized that the trial was going to be set in July, he was going to be in collective bargaining agreements for his national labor union, and he wasn't going to be able to have enough time. Okay. Linda Johnson, the next prosecutor selected, resigned from the case today. She did. Oh, why? Based in part on the conduct we're here discussing, correct? Uh, I, I believe that Ms. Johnson uh, uh, has, Ms. Johnson didn't want their, my understanding is, is that she didn't agree with the decision to have a public hearing. On July 1st, in this matter, you served you as a right of right compliance with oh my 5501, God. correct? I did. Why? She, oh, yeah, she's like, I don't want this. Holy shit, Carrie. What are you running over there, girlfriend? Wow. Wow, chat. Let that sink in. Everybody's fucking bailing. God damn. Maybe they just didn't like her. Yeah, let's see. And um, you've never turned over the report or any of the evidence that we're talking about here at this hearing, correct? Uh, let's take it one at a time. Um, just I did not turn over the report. I didn't have a copy of the report. Um, okay, you knew the about it. You didn't rounds you knew about it. that were left yep. at the Sheriff's Department by Troy Teske 
<laughs> I have absolutely no reason to believe that they are relevant to the incident that took place on the set of Rust. How do you know? These are rounds that were in out. the possession of Bell Reed and never left the state of Arizona. Um, you also did not um, well, you're muted. allow the defense to view that evidence at any point okay. during our request to review evidence in this case. I had never seen it. And I didn't realize that it wasn't under the same case number because I'm not a law enforcement officer and I don't work at the sheriff's department. But uh, you are right. And, and you can We're, see that they are Starline Brass Silver 45, right? I can. Uh, and, and this is the best evidence against Hannah Gutierrez. Yeah, you've said that a couple of times. Um, any favorable <laughs> evidence you understand as a prosecutor has to be turned over to the defense, correct? I do. Any evidence that could be used as a defense to potentially be favorable has to be turned over to the defense. Absolutely. So the third Hague report that never got turned over to the defense, you understand that that's Brady evidence? I did, yes. Okay. And you also failed to turn that over in this case as well, correct? It, what, it, and let me, let, let me give you a full answer to your question. When the second Hague report came in, and I provided all of this to the defense, I sent it to the person who is managing the discovery okay. server and ask them to- Also, real quick, guys, she says it never left the state of Arizona. How do we individually confirm that? Alex Spiro has the right to look at that shit and verify it. Remember, his job isn't supposed to go, hey, you know what, Carrie? Tr I trust you, girl. <laughs> I trust you, girl. No, you he should be allowed to check it to make sure that's true. Carrie says that doesn't fucking mean anything. She can lie. You know, like there was a report she didn't have. She didn't turn over. Like there's, you know, so how do we know she didn't turn anything else over? Remember, she, he has the right to verify this information. His job is not to take Carrie at her word. Upload it. It wasn't until I realized during pretrial interviews that it wasn't there, that there was a problem with it. So I then attempted to figure out what the problem was. And it was indicated to me that it appeared that the former paralegal who was working for the special prosecutor had removed it. So we then immediately provided it. Then during the pretrial interview of Mr. Haig, it was brought to my attention that the defense did not have the August 31st report that indicated that the gun functioned fine, perfectly fine. And that was provided immediately. I went back, I checked my email, I could see that I received it from Mr. Haig and failed to forward it on to be uploaded. And I provided it as soon as I was aware that you did not have it. What was that last um, night? The, the fact that nobody at the Hannah Gutierrez retrial um, cross-examined Mr. Hake about the report didn't clue you into the fact that nobody had the report? Um, <laughs> actually, it didn't, and I'd like to address that. The reason that it didn't clue me in is because Hannah Gutierrez's defense was that the gun worked perfectly. Uh, the, the defense in Hannah Gutierrez was never interested in any evidence that there was an issue with the gun, because if there was an issue with the gun, it damaged her case. So what you could see, if you watched the trial or saw any of the transcripts, the defense actually brought in their own expert uh -oh, to say that the gun worked perfectly. So they had no interest in that information. And, and actually, you elicited testimony from Mr. Haig um, at that trial that was inconsistent at least partially inconsistent as the court's aware with his third report, correct? Tell, tell me what you're referring to and I'll answer your question. Well, there was a whole hearing about this where you saw this and you saw me go back and forth with Mr. Haig for 25 minutes, so I don't. I agree, but I need to know what you're talking about for me to answer your question. Okay, if you can't answer the question, you can't answer the question, I'll move on. I'm happy to, but. The, 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 <laughs> you, you say that That's actually good the, if you don't know what he's gonna say. The of the communications you have yeah. about the doc report um, as you, you relay it to the court is that all you said in response was great. Do that. That's your testimony. Yeah. I, I, I assumed that it was going to be tied to the same case number. So I said, great, do it. File a report. 
No follow-up questions? No, um, because I had a picture of the ammunition that didn't match the ammunition from the set of rust. No concerns in your mind when you got the case file and you turned it over to us that it wasn't included? Absolutely not. There's a there, there's a terabyte of discovery. I didn't know whether this two-page police report had been provided. And in addition to that, I had no reason to believe and still have no reason to believe that those rounds have anything to do with these cases. As I asked you about Mr. Haig um, yesterday when Ms. Popple testified, you would agree with me that her testimony under oath was false. What part of her testimony was false? And I'll answer. That she said that these rounds don't look anything like the rounds on the set when you elicited that testimony. I agree with you. And I didn't realize that there were rounds that looked like that. It's okay. In any event, um, oh, when the court, um, and you never tested those rounds either, correct? Any oh, of the no. rounds that came from Mr. Teske? No, because they came in just a few months ago. And the court asked you actually one question that I want to address, which is, the court said to you, well, what's interesting to me, to be quite honest, is that yesterday you didn't even want to do a written reply. You wanted to just give an oral response. And, and what you said to the court was, I never saw these. I've never seen these. And I never saw the report. I have absolutely never seen these until this morning. Do you remember saying that to the court? With regard to the three Starline brass, um, mm. the, with regard to the three cartridges that appear to be similar to rust, yes. Well, I had never, I'd never saw them until today. Well, but you said also, I never saw the report, right? I never did. Right, but don't you think, given your duty of candor to this court, that that's awfully misleading to not tell the court at that point that you knew about this when it occurred long ago? That I knew about what? You Fuck. knew that Mr. Teske had turned in this evidence, that you knew that the report would have existed because you just told this court that the doc report was okayed by you. Sure. Um, don't you think it was misleading to this court to not just say at that point, you know, just so you know, I know about this. I knew about this then. I was involved. I did not intend to mislead the court. My understanding of what was dropped off at the sheriff's department is on this computer screen, and it looks absolutely nothing like the live rounds from the set of rust. Um, the truth of this matter is um, you don't like Mr. Baldwin very much, do you? You know, that is absolutely untrue. Uh, I actually really appreciate Mr. Baldwin's movies. I really appreciated uh, the <laughs> acting that he did on Saturday Night Live. I really appreciate his politics. Um, you told one of the witnesses who disagreed with you during an interview that you thought Mr. Baldwin was a cocksucker. <laughs> I do not recall seeing that. I know that that was something that Mr. Baldwin would say on the set of rust. I don't recall saying that. You deny that under oath. Sean, why are you off camera? Without having more information, I can tell you that I do not recall ever saying that. Uh -oh. And if I did say it, I invite you to point it out to me. <laughs> Please, you bring it up. Bring it up here. To another witness. To what do you need help? What witness? I'm asking you. Did you Bring call the him video up. Prick during a witness interview? No, I don't believe I did. I don't recall. Do you deny that? Without knowing what you're talking about, I, I all I can tell you is this that I can't respond if I don't know what you're talking about. Bring and the you, evidence. you said also to witnesses that you would Remember, teach him a lesson. Remember, this is a danger zone, and I she just never like said to witnesses walk that right I would in. teach him a lesson. Absolutely not. In fact, Mr. Spyro, I want to give a full response to your question. Too late. I honey. made every effort in this case to resolve this case with your client in a very favorable way for him. All right, I'm going to move to strike this. It's not responsive. It, it is. Responsive. I don't want to talk about plea negotiations. Yeah, and it's not. And it's not. Dolly, do you have the interview I, I he's talking about? Please no. find it. I tell you. Oh my I God! Say, I have no recollection of, of calling him any of those names. I have invited the defendant to please, tell me what he's talking about. It. And he has declined. I want the court to take notice of that. Oh, sweet boy. Thank you. Please you may step have this as an exhibit, please. Oh, damn. All right. Any other witnesses? No, you're right. Oh, All right. So um, argument. Let's not. Um, 15 minutes oh. aside sufficient. Kimberly, so much. Carrie Is needs to take a pregnancy test. Do you want to make argument? Carrie. Oh, no. Till the no, no, no. All right. <laughs>
Yeah, this sex is gonna be so hot tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> dismissal with prejudice is a very extreme sanction. Oh, she might do and, it! Uh, case law is very clear that um, because it's uh, very extreme, I have to go through every single element and I have to make a very good record as to what, why I'm I'm seeing what I'm seeing. She's going to wait till Monday. So, in order to establish a Brady violation, the Brady. defendant must show that the prosecution suppressed evidence, uh -oh. the evidence was favorable to the accused, and the evidence was material to the defense. So let's go through the elements. Suppression of evidence. The definition of suppression of elements, this is Case versus Hatch, is while the first element requires proof that the prosecution suppressed or withheld the evidence in question, it does not require a finding of bad faith or any other culpable state right. of mind on the part of the prosecutor. This is enough. This prong is satisfied. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office and the prosecution failed to disclose the supplemental report to defense this is and provide defense done. an opportunity to inspect the rounds collected into that evidence happens. that Mr. Teske gave. Is the evidence favorable to the accused? The second Brady oh, element is whether the suppressed evidence was favorable to the accused, either as impeachment or exculpatory evidence. The suppressed evidence is favorable to the accused. It is impeachment evidence. Rule. Has even been offered in this trial as impeachment evidence and is potentially exculpatory to the defense. Critically, the exculpatory value cannot be analyzed at such a late juncture because of the non-disclosure. Yep, is the evidence done. material? Well, post-trial discovery of evidence under Brady requires a reasonable probability that the result of the proceeding would have been different. Discovery of evidence during trial requires an evaluation of whether the late tender has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it impacts the fundamental fairness of the proceedings. And that is uh, State versus Huerta Cost Castro. This evidence is material. The late discovery of this evidence during oh! trial has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it has impacted the fundamental fairness of the proceedings. The defense is not in a position to test the state's theory as to the source of the live rounds that killed Ms. Hutchins. As I said, I'm also going to take a look at Harper. State versus Harper. Yes. The assessment of sanctions depends upon the extent of the government's He's culpability, right. weighed against the amount of prejudice to the state. Quoting Probably Sharda. more than when he killed Elena. Let's go through culpability. Our case law generally provides that the refusal to comply with a district court's discovery order only rises to the level of exclusion or dismissal where the state's conduct is especially culpable, I want to see such Terry. as where evidence is unilaterally withheld by the state's head. Or all access to the evidence is precluded by state and transients. The state is highly culpable for its failure to provide this discovery to the mm -hmm. defendant. The state unilaterally withheld the supplemental report. Santa Fe County Sheriff's Officer made the decision, and apparently also with the, with the prosecutor, pursuant to Hancock's testimony, that the evidence was of no evidentiary value and failed to connect the evidence to the instant case. The case agent, as well as pursuant to Hancock's testimony, Ms. Morrissey, was aware of the new evidence and yet did not make an effort to disclose it to defense. The state's willful withholding of this information was intentional and deliberate. If this conduct does not rise to the level of bad faith, it certainly comes so near to bad faith as to show signs of scorching. Prejudice. When discovery has been produced late, prejudice does not accrue unless the evidence is material and the disclosure is so late that it undermines the definition the defendant's preparation for trial. The court concludes that this conduct is highly prejudicial to the defendant. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and this disclosure during the course of trial is so late that it undermines the defendant's preparation for trial. There is no way for the court to write this wrong. Start the buses. Lesser sanctions under Harper. Trial courts possess broad discretionary authority to decide what sanction to impose when a discovery order is violated. State versus Lemire. The sanction of dismissal is the only warranted remedy. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and a mistrial would not be based upon manifest necessity. 
Further, the sanction of dismissal is warranted in this case. The state has repeatedly made representations to defense and to the court that they were compliant with all their discovery obligations. Despite their repeated representations, they have continued to fail to disclose critical evidence to the defendant. Brady and Harper are satisfied. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted. Court also has power, inherent power. Oh, damn. Per State versus Lemire, where discovery violations inject needless delay into the proceedings, courts may impose meaningful sanctions to effectuate their inherent power and promote efficient judicial administration. The state's discovery violation has injected a needless, incurable delay into the instant jury trial. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted to ensure the integrity of the judicial system and the efficient administration of justice. The motion to dismiss with prejudice is granted. Wow. That's it, Chad. This is why you don't fuck up. Now, what with respect to the, the jury, I don't imagine you all want to return on Monday. I will take care of the jury. Thank you. We are in recess. I mean... That's funny, the jury's gonna come back on Monday until you told to go home. <laughs> oh no. Okay, so where's that dude who goes around nutting on people? God damn, he's like, fuck, he's like, he's crying because he has to go home with Alaria. He's like, I'm going to go to prison. Not yet. Yes, that, that was real emotion from him. Yeah. That was real that, emotion. That, that wasn't the, uh, whatchamacallit, no tear That's thing. the stress coming free. Yeah. Okay, so when do we think his uh, reality show is going to premiere? Wait, 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 wait. There's another trial, right? <laughs> No. What? No, this is it. No. Dismissal with what prejudice. Time? Done. None. Not, dismissal with prejudice. He cannot be retried. It's with prejudice. Yep, it's over. Wait, wait, wait. I missed that. Yep. It's over. Yep. You just told Hilaria, go start the car. Whoa. Barbara Warble, yes, there is double jeopardy now. The jury was impaneled. Okay. So okay, but what can like, just like put Hannah? They like request like Bulls, immediate Bulls release. Bulls decided not to. Bulls. Hold on, guys. We're gonna down for a second. Bulls decided not to use that evidence, so it doesn't matter. He said he didn't want it. <laughs> I mean, so idiots. <laughs> oh man. You hear that screaming? That's Hannah from prison right now. Yeah. Well, it probably, well, here's the thing. And guys, here's the deal. The issue is how does Alec Baldwin's team know that that's true? Oh, these didn't look like that. There's no way they left the state of Arizona. We don't know. There's no way for them to know because they haven't been able to investigate. They could send their people out, they could investigate, they could have interviewed Thel Reed. And if they have known about this, they could have asked him. I'm sure they've talked to him already. But they didn't have that information to go talk to Thel Reed. That's the problem here. You know, when you hide fucking evidence, this is the fucking problem. And here's the thing. They didn't even hide it. It just sounds like they're incompetent. They've gone through so many fucking people. Shit got lost in the mix. You know, as the poem goes, for want of a horseshoe nail, a kingdom was lost. Collected into evidence. 